everyone and welcome to another episode of the Arrow Rights Podcast. Today we have Lauren who's going to talk about her experiences with invisible disabilities and yeah so Lauren do you want to introduce yourself in a bit more detail? Yeah thank you so much Pravdolf I appreciate being mm-hmm. on the show today um, and love what you're building um, with our rights mm-hmm. podcast. Um, my name is Lauren Friedman I'm the host and creator of Uninvisible Pod, which is an award-winning podcast about invisible and chronic illness and disability. And it was inspired by my own experiences of Mm -hmm. um, being diagnosed, really having my life turn Mm -hmm. upside down, uh, being diagnosed with an invisible illness. Um, This happened to me about four years ago. Okay. Uh, I was... Uh, I went through a major health crisis, had to leave my job, was experiencing cognitive decline, uh, functional exhaustion, uh, Mm -hmm. joint pain. I just couldn't do my work. I couldn't show up even for Mm -hmm. myself. And um, I have been diagnosed with anxiety and depression since I was a teenager. So that's stuff that I've been living with Mm -hmm. and managing for 20 odd years. But um, the this functional exhaustion and cognitive decline in particular were really worrying. And I ended up being diagnosed with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is an autoimmune disorder that affects the thyroid and and causes hypothyroidism. Um, And it means that my body is a battleground. Um, This Mm -hmm. is what happens when you have an autoimmune disorder, um, which many people who are watching the show will know. Um, In addition, I was simultaneously diagnosed with obstructive sleep apnea, um, Mm -hmm. and I've since been diagnosed with insulin resistance. So there's a lot of health stuff and gut health stuff in particular that I'm working at at the moment. And here we are four Mm -hmm. years later. But when I had to start using the medical system with a bit more desperation, I experienced medical gaslighting early on. Okay. Your listeners are familiar with that. But do you want to explain it? Yeah, um, it's when someone, in particular a doctor, but um, it can happen with anyone, uh, tells you that what you think is real isn't, tells you that it's in your head. So I had an experience where I was sitting in front of an endocrinologist who'd put me on medication and we were treating my Hashimoto's and I had scrambled in uh, one morning before work and Mm -hmm she uh, looked at my chart and she looked at me and she said, well, you're doing great. And I said, I don't feel great. I said, I don't feel any different. She said, well, maybe it's time you see a psychiatrist. Okay. And I was flabbergasted and didn't know what to say. I was speechless, which is unusual for me. Um, And if she had actually read my chart properly, she would have seen, I also had a psychiatrist on my team, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And I remember leaving that appointment and calling my mom, who's been a fierce advocate for me since day one. And she said, well, you're never seeing that doctor again. And Hmm. it was the first time that I'd ever been like, well, I guess I won't see this doctor again. I grew up in New York Mm -hmm. City. I always had access to like the best doctors, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, it was always doctor is God. What doctor says is right. And this was the first time that what doctor said didn't match what I knew to be happening physiologically. Mm -hmm. And I had a support system in my family and my friends. Mm -hmm. Um, And it even took me several months and several years to begin to get on a path to wellness, let alone diagnosis. And I realized that this was happening to a lot of people in my life. Um, Mm -hmm. I started reaching out to my network and saying, this is what's going on with me somebody help. Um, Mm -hmm. And I mean, record numbers of people started coming out of the woodwork and saying to me, I also have this invisible illness where I had this thyroid health crisis, especially women in their mid to late thirties and above. And um, I'd been writing in women's health at the time, women's health and hygiene and, and, Mm -hmm. you know, talking about the fact that we don't even talk about our periods, Yeah, uh, (laughs) you know, these other conditions that so many of us were living with. And so I, um, I realized that if this is what I was experiencing, what was it like for the people who I knew who didn't have the support yeah. that I had? Um, and why not talk about it? Um, mm-hmm. And for all of those reasons, uh, and because I have a background as an actor, I actually trained over in the UK. Oh, okay. 
um, for all of those reasons, I decided to start the podcast and, and start the conversation. Um, Definitely, and it's been an yeah. incredibly rewarding experience and I've become a patient advocate and my life has changed because of my diagnosis. So for the better, I should say. So, um, yeah, it's been a whirlwind, but here we are. <laughs> yeah. But like, I loved how you're using your diagnosis, like the invisible disability and autoimmune disease to like start to talk about it because I know with disabilities, you tend to shy away from it. You don't talk about it as much, especially when you have an invisible one. Like yeah. I, be, I talked to another lady who's going to appear in my episode, but she was talking about specifically disabled toilets, how some people with invisible disabilities may use them, but they'd be stigmatized around because they were like, oh, oh yeah, you don't have a physical disability. Why, why do you need to use a disabled toilet? So it's something that society puts pressure on to disabled people because it's not just physical disabilities it's also like invisible disabilities mental disabilities mental health is in that category of invisible yeah. and chronic illness as far as I'm concerned and definitely yeah. I mean it is it's one of the most frustrating things in the world mm -hmm. that we live in a world where people mm -hmm. expect visual signifiers you know your skin yeah. color is different your gender appears to be different your you know there's all of people want to put people in boxes. And oh, yeah. what I'm trying to do with this conversation is make people realize that like, we're all in this box, um, you know, that chronic illness is on the rise, whether that's because doctors are acknowledging it more or because our environments are working against our bodies for, for better mm -hmm. or for worse. So there are more and more of us who are being diagnosed with these invisible conditions. And um, these conditions and disabilities, it, it, the way I see it are more common than not. I mean, we're looking at like a third of the population in the mm -hmm. US who are living with chronic invisible illness. Um, and if we don't start to accept the fact that people live with these diagnoses, um, we're all lost. You know, we're living in a world that's mm -hmm. more and more splintered. We're fighting against each other when we should be working together. Um, so my Definitely. message has been, yeah, my message has been one of unity, but also of acknowledging what other people are going through, mm -hmm. being able to see things through other people's eyes um, and, you know, pushing for change because of that. Um, mm -hmm. I, I really think that a lot of this comes down to acknowledging the fact that these illnesses exist, you know, and that yeah, these diagnoses definitely. exist and that these people are important. Um, and yeah, removing stigma. For me, it's about smashing mm -hmm. it, smashing all those stigmas. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> really encouraging mm -hmm. people to change their perspective. Yeah, definitely. Like today, I think society puts pressure on disabled people to like try to treat themselves. Like even for you don't know what's going to happen because with disabilities, because I suffer from cerebral palsy since I was born, but I was diagnosed at the age of three. Mm. I was diagnosed with it and I never knew that I had it since birth. So since then, it's been a physical disability. But then later on, I was diagnosed with stage one cancer as well later on in my teenage years and that really reflected the whole thing because I fitted into two categories at the time having a disability and a medical condition like it was a bit crazy it was a whirlwind as well but I think for society they're trying to put pressure onto the same people to get better even for if you have a disability you don't know if you were it's being treatable like you know some Invis like invisible disabilities and stuff like that they don't necessarily you can't treat them so I think society still puts that pressure on to them saying like you can't do certain activities because of your restrictions like we can still yeah. do a lot of stuff despite our yeah. disabilities and no one realizes that and I, I would also I, I would actually challenge your audience to think about cancer actually mm -hmm. um because i've come to see cancer as a chronic illness yeah um that it's something that is often environmental um you know that causes it and um that it is something that for some people we find cures for others we don't it varies in severity mm -hmm. Um, those I know who have survived it now spend their lives preventing a recurrence, mm -hmm. um, you know, much like you would prevent a recurrence of a flare in any other chronic illness. Mm -hmm. um, and that these are all diseases. They're all, you know, a lack of 
100% health in the body, but also who has 100% health. Yeah. Um, you know, we're all dealing with something like I'm sure, you know, these wellness entrepreneurs who mm -hmm. are, you know, um, and many of them come out and say that they have mental health struggles as well, you know, so like, yeah, there's something definitely. relatable in all of this, but we don't know about it with people unless we talk about it, unless we confront it. Um, and I mean, we're seeing in our world right now, a confrontation of a lot of historical issues um, that are coming to the fore. And I see disability, invisible chronic illness. I see mm -hmm. that as part of the discussion as well. Um, we talk about intersectionality a lot, um, different layers of identity. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, that includes disability. It includes invisible mm -hmm. illness. Um, it also includes gender and sexuality and race and ethnicity and religion and, you know, all of these other factors mm -hmm. that make us who we are. But part of this is about embracing that uniqueness and embracing that individuality, but acting as a collective, being able to support one another mm -hmm. so that people who go through these rough experiences have that support even if maybe they don't have family or friends to support them as well. Um, so being able to advocate for others and encourage people to see things through a different lens is really the goal of my work. That's really interesting to say because I never like seen that intersexuality could be related to any disability or anything. Like when I was going through my cancer, I only suffered from cancer for three months because I was only stage one. And it was also endometrial cancer, so it affected my periods. And eventually I ended up getting my womb removed at the age of 17. Wow. And that time I had to think about fertility and all of that. So I think what, what we're talking about, if we need to be more aware about it, because when I was 17, I didn't know anyone who went through it at all, because they tend to happen to older women. So I only ever knew one other person who was a little bit older than I was when I was diagnosed, but at the time I didn't know anyone else. So we started interacting and talking to each other and finding awareness within each other. And like, I suddenly became like the youngest person to have this type of cancer, which was a bit scary because it did affect my fertility in the long term. And with my disability, it was kind of like trying to advocate those for a really long time because I also suffer from anxiety, depression and PTSD and I still suffer from that but I'm trying to learn from it as well from listening to other people's stories and that's why I started this podcast to be honest. So when you were like when you got diagnosed with Hashimoto disease what, what what were you feeling at the time that you got diagnosed with all these conditions? The first feeling was relief. I remember um going into work and being like, I have a diagnosis, let's have cake, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> um, because the wonderful thing about diagnosis for those of us who go through these health crises mm -hmm. is that it gives you a game plan. It gives you a name. You can name the thing. Um, yeah. You know, it's kind of like Voldemort, right? It's like <laughs> being able to name the thing removes a lot of the fear and the trepidation mm -hmm. and so uh, immediately I got the diagnosis and I was like well we have diagnostic you know sort of structures around this and the doctors were telling me you know we might go route a we might go route b but you know mm -hmm. we have um plans in place for you and I thought fantastic so now there is a pathway for me to get back to where I was okay um which mm -hmm. Interestingly, at least from a, a perspective, a mental health perspective, in many ways, I've gone beyond that. You know, I've, I've experienced my own growth personally during this, this period of healing and, and treatment. And what I've discovered is that there's often a grieving of your, your former self, your former health, mm -hmm. you know, um, but I was able to experience that concurrently with the celebration, right? Mm -hmm. um, and who I have embraced, the parts okay. of me that I have embraced mm -hmm. that I've stepped into more and more over the last several years um, are better than they would have been otherwise. You know, like I've discovered that this has made me better um, from mm -hmm. a, a, a mental health wellness 
love relationships perspective, it made me a better friend. It made me a better daughter, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so ultimately one of my very good friends, um, Damien Washington, um, he says the cost of admission to this chronic illness club, this disability club, it's very high. You know, a lot of us lose friends, we lose family, we lose people, we lose ourselves. Definitely, yeah. But it's wonderful if you find your community. And for me, I had the same thing where, you know, I recognized that part of Mm -hmm. encouraging other people to tell their stories was about creating inclusion. It was about um, reminding people that they're not alone. And I struggled to find community that really addressed what I was going through specifically. And where I found it lacking, I decided to create it for myself. And so now I have this community of people who are all fellow Spoonies, um, (laughs) who we all understand each other's experiences. And as it happens along the way, I've also Mm -hmm. had friends find out that who thought they were perfectly healthy, that they're living with their own chronic illnesses and get them treated. And so I've been helping them. Um, which has also moved me forward into the work that I'm doing as I'm about to start training as a health and wellness coach, you know, because this is what I've been doing. Yeah. (laughs) That's crazy. Yeah. But I I do think there's synchronicity when you sort of fall into the things that you're supposed to be doing. For me, this is the first time I feel like I'm doing work that capitalizes on all my varied skills that I've spent Mm -hmm. my life developing. um, And you know, I've met incredible people. It's, it's made me change my mind. And if that's happened to me, I want to be able to pass it on to other people. Definitely. I think talking to other people is definitely a thing that you should be doing when, for example, if you're diagnosed with something, because obviously it helps you to talk to other people and seeing their experiences and taking some advice from them to be able to cope it with yourself. And like, I think with the whole feeling of being diagnosed, I was also thinking the same thing, like finally there's a diagnosis because six years before my diagnosis, I just kept having heavy, heavy, heavy periods, like Mm -hmm. unexplained reasons, went to doctors, got admitted to hospital like a couple of times. And because in the UK, it's like free healthcare. So that's a whole other thing. That's another thing. Yeah. Yeah. Like for me, I was admitted a couple of times to emergency because of what's been happening and no one's been able to solve it and when I first firstly got diagnosed I was a bit relieved that it happened but then when like a couple minutes afterwards I was thinking oh shit it's cancer it's cancer I was like that's a bit scary but then I think and then they couldn't find a cause to it like there was no direct cause to it it was there there's still there's still cancer. there there isn't with many with with autoimmune disease we don't know why yeah it could be could be like genetics that. or anything so my, the first is huge. diet is huge nutrition mm-hmm. you know you're definitely lifestyle. what i'm discovering is that your relationships are as important in that if you're if you have toxic relationships that's going to affect you physically it's going to affect mm-hmm. you emotionally you know so our body, mind, spirit, it, they're all connected, you know? So if we look at things rather than the way the medical system wants us to view things where mm-hmm. we're in silos, right? Like there's a brain doctor, there's a heart doctor, yeah. there's a skin doctor. What if we looked at things from a bit more of an integrative perspective and mm-hmm. said, okay, but this emotional issue might be causing this, this uh, breathing issue, which could cause a heart issue, you know, like, all of these things are tied together. I, I, I see my diagnoses as, as one rather than okay. things, you know, and, mm-hmm. and I've managed to put together a medical team that sees things from that perspective too. But it, it's a challenge when you're working against this traditional Western model, exactly. you know, of healthcare. And, and in this country, you're also dealing with extortionate costs. I mean, I'm yeah. <laughs> Um, and that can prevent accessibility for, so there are people who are living with chronic conditions who may never get diagnosed because no one ever sits down and says, because of the cost to feel that way, you know, especially I think about women with their periods, like if your period's causing you pain, go see a doctor. Definitely. It's not supposed to cause you pain, you know? So, um, the awareness, the open discussion of these Mm -hmm. things, um, being able to 
put together really your own strength in advocacy. I had to step into a stronger position to be able to say, I'll see that doctor, but Mm -hmm. not that one. This is my kind of person. This isn't my kind of person. This is going to help me in my healing. And this is going to hinder me. That kind of discernment, Mm -hmm. it comes with experience. Um, And in, in both our medical systems, we have really, we don't have a lot of choice all the time. Oh, definitely. We're seeing, right. And being able to remind individuals that, if you're allowing someone to tend to your body, which is a sacred place, you have to approve of them. You're allowed to say, no, I want a different person. And a lot of people don't know they have that choice. Yeah. Um, A lot of people in this country don't have that choice if they're on certain healthcare plans. Um, And so we need to change the system. I mean, the system here is broken. The system in the UK um, works better but there are still there are still like don't know about there are still some broken aspects in the nhs like exactly for example for example now like even for loads of people attend to medical care in the uk longer waiting times much more longer waiting times like even if you were taken by ambulance you could be waiting for such a long time like when i was admitted i was bleeding so much that i felt like I was going to like pass pass out or something. When I got to the when I got to the A and E, I had to wait six hours just to see a doctor. Like that was so crazy, and it was like literally a quarter of my day gone. And then I managed to get into a bed, but then doctors took even more longer just to talk to me. Like the healthcare system is also is very they had a shortage of beds especially with the coronavirus pandemic like with with that the beds are really short in the UK like there was already a shortage of beds and ward space and all of that but with this pandemic it's gone even more worse than it already is I I think think the pandemic's revealed a lot of what's broken you know the, mm. the priorities that are given to people who don't necessarily have pre-existing conditions, mm-hmm. um, the racial and gender disparities, um, you know, and, and some of the stories I've heard particularly out of the UK about people who are severely disabled and might require um, mm-hmm. breathing assistance, right? You know, who are And told, you wouldn't get it. And they're literally told, I'm your doctor, I'm signing off on unplugging you. I if know. someone else comes in with COVID or whatever. And I think like, that's oh, why in the U I think that's why in the UK there's like higher rates of COVID because they're literally ignoring people with disabilities or medical conditions or like even like that. Like I'm very vulnerable to the coronavirus because of my cancer and my immune system isn't as strong. So yeah. Um I wasn't told to shield apart from more 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 vulnerable people but I should be I should have been told that because I am still vulnerable to the disease and I'm shielding on my behalf but normally like they would have gave you a letter if you was like oh you're sh- you need to shield but I didn't receive any letter regarding yeah. that so I didn't even know if I was vulnerable until I went back to my university in September and they told me yeah you're vulnerable to the disease I did not know before and I think it's the lack of information like even to something like a pandemic and well, yeah, even we're still learning about it as we go too but mm-hmm. you know. and, and look it sounds like we're vilifying these systems by the same token the NHS is amazing that in the UK your health care is considered a human right it is from an american perspective this is a groundbreaking it's a business it's like a business in america whereas here it is it is more interest has really uh ruined healthcare here you know and like we need Mm. to break the system and change it up entirely because our priorities have gone yeah but i think between the healthcare here and the healthcare in america what i found is that in the UK people are willing to pay taxes towards other people's healthcare because we all pay in tax just to pay out. Basically, we kind of do pay for our healthcare through taxes. But I think in the US, people 
tend to be more selfish and want to pay for their own healthcare. That's why the mm-hmm. healthcare system is like that and private businesses are taken over. That's why I see the difference is that American people tend to want to pay for themselves and not allowing other people, not allowing their money to go to other people's healthcare, especially well, if, for example, like if an alcoholic until or... Help, until they need help. Yeah. What, what people fail to realize is that we are all going to require the use mm-hmm. of the medical system at some stage, whether it happens to you when you're 85 or it happens mm-hmm. to you when you're five. We're all going to need the healthcare system. So paying into it communally makes sense. It does. We're all going to use it, but capitalism has really altered people's opinions. Definitely, definitely. Of what I deserve and what you deserve and this sense Mm -hmm. of otherness. Um, That's why it really needs to be fixed in the US because for us, it's like we're caring more about other people through the NHS and it's such an amazing thing and it saved my life, to be honest. But I think in America, loads of people would have benefited something like the NHS in the US. It would have benefited so much. But I think in America, for example, if you have someone who's an alcoholic and drank too much and one day you might need a liver transplant, someone in America might think, why do I need to pay for his health care? He should have took responsibility for that. That's that's why the American system is like that because they're thinking in that way. So, oh, sometimes it's their mistake that they have to go ahead pay attention to the medical system so I think it's yeah and the similarity here between what I see in the NHS and what I've experienced Mm -hmm. here in the U.S. as well is that we're really good at treating acute conditions right like we're great at emergency Mm -hmm. even if people keep have to be kept waiting right like Mm -hmm. really good at treating the problem when it occurs we're no good at prevention yeah and if we were able to invest more in prevention um to be able to get people on a pathway where they're eating foods that don't cause inflammation that won't Mm -hmm. then cause the occurrence of of disease yeah then we would be preventing all of these long-term conditions and people would be living happier healthier lives we also fail to take into account quite often the connection between mind and body and you never hear about mental health support being offered to people who are living with physical conditions And it's so key, you know, Mm -hmm. um, one thing that comes up a lot in my interviews is that when you're diagnosed with a physical condition, it it can turn your life upside down. And if you don't have mental health support through that, um, whether it's through your community or otherwise, it is very easy to become lost. I I completely agree with you with that because of my several Mm -hmm. policies, I do have mental health conditions on the side. And so like with the whole thing when I was around 11 or 12 I got bullied to the point that I was having suicidal thoughts because my mental health wasn't good and that's when I was diagnosed with anxiety and depression because I was having panic attacks a lot and I was feeling really really low with myself Mm -hmm. at to the point that I was thinking those thoughts because it's something that I can't change in my body like with cerebral palsy I couldn't change that so I was like, like literally, but then if something turned around and my coping mechanism was having an eating disorder as well. So I had an eating disorder called PICA. And I don't know if anyone's heard this, but PICA is literally when you eat inedible items, basically. Uh. So some people eat like chalk, clay. I ate paper, basically. That was my coping mechanism to get over the anxiety, the depression. And then you can control. I couldn't control that. I could not control because my mind was telling me otherwise. And then the PTSD came from my cancer diagnosis because now every time I go to a hospital, like to the cancer center, I get very, very anxious. I get very like, it brings me back to that time. And it's still affecting me kind of today, but I don't have eating eating disorder. I've gone over that like five years ago. That was done. And I managed to get that on my own. I did not seek for help when I was trying to overcome it. And I think from the whole experience, I think that people need to be more aware about mental health as a whole when you have a disability, because 
even though you have a disability, you can't just put more things on a person or else their mental health can get really bad. And trauma, what trauma does to her bodies, you know, Definitely. trauma or physical trauma. I mean, we look at this collective trauma that people in the U.S. at least are, are undergoing right now that, that we're all going through worldwide with COVID, right? Um, mm-hmm. Here in the U.S., we're also having these, we just had a, a, an attempted coup, um, you know, in the Capitol. And there is collective trauma around that. And mm-hmm. where are the, the offerings from our health professionals to work through that trauma? Um, whether individually or in community. And so, um, and I know, excuse me, this isn't to say that uh, there aren't lots of people helping. You always mm-hmm. have to, as, as Mr. Rogers taught us, you have to look for the helpers. Um, but I do think it's just important to recognize that we're just much more sensitive than I think our systems have heretofore given us credit. And it's important for us to recognize that it's okay to pause and to Mm -hmm. adjust definitely um, to empower ourselves i mean this is the other thing is like part of the reason why i do what i do why you're doing what you do is to empower Mm -hmm. other people not only to find community Mm -hmm. to know that they're not alone but Mm -hmm. also to know that there's a way through Mm -hmm. um and that whether they have their support or they need to seek it further afield they will be able to find the resources to get through um and for those of us who go through these chronic conditions, we're going to now spend our lifetimes preventing recurrence. You mm-hmm. know, um, many of us go through sort of a, a health evolution where mm-hmm. for me, you know, I've completely overhauled my lifestyle because I don't want to spend a year in bed again, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and we've, we've faced the loss of our health. We've faced that grief, we faced that transformation, but not everyone is able to see even these experiences as opportunities. You know, even that that slight reframing that like, this sucks, but there is something on the other side of it, you know, and to remind other people that, that there is something on the other side of it is, I mean, we lose far too many people because yeah. they don't think they're strong enough. Um, and if we can give them examples of, of where to find the strength, direct them to resources, um, show them that there is community out there. And I will say also that the disability and chronic illness community has been one of the most inclusive that I have ever experienced. And mm-hmm. honestly, you know, look, every, there are bigots everywhere, mm-hmm. but, and there's judgment everywhere, but this has been one of the most accepting communities and, and one that I've learned and grown so much from. Um, and being able to understand Mm -hmm. these intersections of these, you know, complex layers of identity, Mm -hmm. being able to accept ourselves fully for who we are and offer that same acceptance to other people. If we all move forward with that level of compassion and empathy, what a different world we would live in. Definitely. I completely agree with you that right there, like, I, I know that the disability and medical condition community is so accepting, like, even, even if someone was discriminated against the community like a couple of years ago and then they end up getting like a chronic illness or anything they're still accepting they're still accepting that one person who could maybe criticize it so it's not so people shouldn't be scared when they say they have a disability or a medical condition because people do face that on a day-to-day basis and the only thing that people want is support and help and guidance for it so one last question I'm going to ask you is what advice would you give to anyone who has chronic illness or to like empower them and advocate those rights? Number one is that you're not alone. Mm-hmm. Um, whether you're able to go on social media and look up hashtags related to your illness or symptoms, mm-hmm. um, know that there is community out there and there are resources out there. I mean, shameless self-promotion here, but like I was able to um, partner with um, a a woman who's become a good friend of mine um, who I met through patient advocacy. Um, Her name is Natalie Beavers and she's the founder of Angels of Epilepsy, which is an epilepsy um, charity. And um, she and I were able to partner on a free ebook, right? That is called Hacking Healthcare. It's specifically for people in the US, but 
it sort of is a primer for here's how to get into using this medical system. Um, mm -hmm. And we plan to keep that updated, you know, so there's plenty of free resources. There's plenty of free community, whether you're on Facebook or, you know, Instagram or otherwise, um, you are not alone. You are not the only person who's going through what you're going through. There are other people who are going through the, the same things and can relate to you. Um, the other is that you have a, a divine right to be okay, to, to find yeah. care. So if, mm -hmm. if you are stuck in a system that is not serving you with a doctor, who's not serving you with a community, that's not serving you know that you are worthy of being here. You're here for a reason. Mm -hmm. And that, um, there is something on the other side of this. Um, you know, for me, the big lesson was that I became a better person because of it, you know, um, and I hope that you're able to find that as well, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and the other one, I would say of the two other pieces, one is mm -hmm. if you're dealing with something physical, get mental health care, yeah. um, you know, and, and ask for a referral from whether it's your referring GP or your emergency room doctor, just ask for mental health care. Um, even if you don't think you need it, we could all use someone to talk to. So. Mm -hmm know that that's also your right. Um, and the other part of it that I would recommend, and this one is sound might sound a bit more out of the box, but it's something that comes up quite a lot on my podcast as well, is that um, considering other forms of healthcare, right? Look at your healthcare um, from a more holistic point of view. If you're able to access integrative or functional medicine, please go do that. Um, I know that it can be hard to access because of the price. Um, and we see lots of GoFundMes that pop up for people to be able to go to these kinds of doctors, but there is a much more whole body system approach in those kinds of um, medical approaches. These are doctors who are encouraged to see the connection between things rather than the separation. Um, and if you're able to put a team together, um, make sure you, you have a doctor who leads that team that you trust and maybe who is able to look at all of these things in connection to one another and that your doctors are communicating just like your cells are communicating with each other. Mm -hmm. um, there should be that kind of complementary coexistence. Um, and I'm someone, for example, who was lucky enough to find uh, I discovered functional medicine. It was the thing that really was able to get me to where I am today, um, mm -hmm. which is relatively decent health, you know, but a lot of that for me included nutrition. It included lifestyle and fitness and exercise mm -hmm. um, and not from a weight loss perspective, but from okay. a being okay perspective, <laughs> right? That like, I need to keep this machine running. Yeah. So I need to keep it in condition, you know? Um, and especially, you know, I would challenge women to, to rethink that, you know, the diet exercise thing, mm -hmm. try to find a way to, to see it through the lens of health rather than this weight loss BS that we get fed a lot of the time. Yeah. Right now. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, I was lucky to find these doctors who were like, what if we also tried acupuncture? What if we also tried mm -hmm. massage for your joints? What if we went to PT for this, you know, thing here or mm -hmm. chiropractic or, so there are lots of like holistic things. I found like a huge thing something that's made a huge difference for me has been meditation. And yeah. Free, you know, so, um, being able to embrace these perhaps alternative care options, but also being able to find doctors who know when to seek evidence-based, um, positive change. I mean, there is evidence, scientific data to support the fact that meditation can encourage better health, you know? So like, if we know that that is something that is mm -hmm. evidence-based, maybe give it a Do try. it, yeah, do it, definitely. Like yeah. with meditation, it's like more, me, more people need to know about it. Like it definitely does improve your health in the long run. And when I started meditating, it definitely did change my health as well. Like I'm more better now. And my mental health is getting up better since I started meditating, so. Yeah. It's very encouraging. So thank you, Lauren, for coming on. Yeah, thank and you. And do you want to promote your podcast, maybe? 
I'd love to. If you want to follow along with more of my work, um, you can find my website at uninvisiblepod.com. Okay. You can also find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at uninvisiblepod. And yeah, I, I hope that you're able to, you're, you can mm -hmm. download the podcast wherever you listen, whether that's Stitcher, iTunes, Spotify, whatever. It's on all the platforms. We'll be launching a YouTube very soon. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. So you'll be able to, you know, listen there as well. Um, but yeah, please do listen along. I've been doing the podcast now for, gosh, just started the third year of the podcast. Oh, God, so there's yeah. over a hundred episodes out. I release one every week mm -hmm. um, on Wellness Wednesday. So um, please go check it out and and just search maybe your disease category and see if there's someone who's maybe going through the same thing, mm -hmm. whose story we've been able to share. Um, and don't be afraid to reach out. Yeah. Thank you so much. So thank you everyone for coming and make sure to subscribe to the channel and obviously subscribe to our podcast as well. So see you guys later. Bye.